Good morning, good morning. I'm gonna go left or right. I can go left or right. Left is a slightly faster, like a minute faster, but you have to uh, uh, go on a lot of fast roads with a load of maniac boy racers. Let's get that right. And uh, if I turn right, then I go down country roads, which are very windy and can get icy in the winter. And then I have to go around the top of Manston where all the lorries are queuing up for Dover. So they both have pluses and minuses, really. So it's standard security practice not to take the same route to work every day. So if I was gonna do it properly, I would toss a coin and go the route whichever the coin told me to, but I don't, I just go. I just decide when I get in the car, I just decide, yes, I'm gonna go left or I'm gonna go right. Anyway, good morning, how are you? Hope you're well. I am well. I'm mid-vaccine. The Chancellor has delivered his budget yesterday. It was the end of the tax year. So, do you see all that wood over there on the right? I'm having, I'm, I'm running into, all the time you run into new problems trying to get these videos together. And what I've done is I'm doing them, combining them with the webcam footage, which is good. And then the webcam footage sort of rolls off after a while. So you have to grab it before it gets overwritten by a new webcam footage. Anyway, I've got some outrageous driving to show you from yesterday, if I can get it on, get it on the video. So, oh Rishi Sunak, it's his second budget, guy's a billionaire, as you, as you expect now in government, government are all millionaires, billionaires, and uh, used to work in a venture capital firm called the Children's Investment Company or something, Children's, yeah I think it's called the Children's Fund or something. Anyway, uh, his boss, his old boss, has just broken the record for earning the most of anybody in the country. Over 530 million, I think he paid himself last year. So these are the sort of people who are, you know, in charge of uh, making sure we don't all starve to death. Uh, they're not doing a very good job of it because they seem to have had, they seem to have all our money. <laughs> so. Uh, the reason why they're trying to make sure that we don't starve to death is because they've got all the all the income. Anyway, the uh, the collapse of Western civilization is continuing, although not at the speed everyone expects. You know, it took the Romans several hundred years to collapse, and uh, when you explain to people why why uh, the current financial system is going to collapse. Uh, three weeks later, they're, they're asking you why it hasn't already happened. So, the reason why it hasn't already happened is the reason why there's a volcano in uh, Iceland, I think, which is about to erupt. And the guy who's uh, monitoring it said that uh, it's not about to erupt, but he says it's exhibiting behaviour of a type that we normally see before a volcano erupts. So he just thought he'd let everyone in Iceland know. And everyone all over the world is interested because the last time a decent volcano blew up in Iceland, it sent ash so far into the atmosphere they had to stop all flights uh, in Northern Europe because uh, of the worry that the ash would get ingested into the engines and not they only know, cause a flame island, out, think, but right. uh, the the real reason was the very, and very the fine uh, carborundum uh, particles that you get in ash uh, would absolutely knacker an engine. It would literally, like, uh, 
Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, putting uh, carburetor paste in your, in your, in your car engine. It would just knacker it. So they didn't want to fly because they didn't want uh, the maintenance, I think, basically. Well, actually, it's fair enough. I don't mind. It affected a few people. It's like all these, all these big things, you know, you think, Oh, that's affected a load of people, but not me, and then a load of other people, but not me. You, you just have to be very unlucky to get caught up in these things. The real reason was a very, very fine harbour under. I'm talking about geological time, basically. You know, uh, a, a volcano might erupt once every hundred years or something, or possibly even a th every thousand years. You know, and so. Even if you're sitting on top of it, <laughs> there should be enough time on a human level to get off the top of it before uh, before it blows up. Just because the volcano time and your time are, are two, com two completely different scales. It's thinking in hundreds of thousands of years, you're thinking in hundreds and thousands of seconds. So it's the same with the uh, economic uh, thing. The narrative that we're going to grow our way out of the debt is gaining traction uh, because it's the only tolerable narrative. It's the only narrative that the population will not panic over. Uh, they need some reassurance. The reassurance they're being given is that uh, we can grow the economy faster than the debt, which is which is complete tosh. <laughs> because apart from defaulting on all your obligations like pensions and social security and and uh, you know paying the armed forces and stuff like that, apart from defaulting is option one, and that's generally not. You know, that's, that only happens in, in totally bankrupt countries, usually. You've lost a major war. Uh, so, so you can't default. And so the narrative then becomes, we'll grow faster than the debt. Which is tosh, because if your economy was growing faster than the debt, you wouldn't be in debt. <laughs> You're only in debt because you've spent faster than the economy has grown. And so to say that, uh, don't worry, uh, everything's going to go backwards and everything's going to work the reverse of how it's worked every year up to now, uh, we'll be able to back our way away from the edge of the cliff. It's, it's just, uh, it's, it's exactly that, it's just a narrative. It's, just, it's designed to reassure people that um, there's no, there is no catastrophe around the corner. Well, the third way of uh, defaulting on government debts is to um, devalue the currency, to debase the currency by sort of printing it and keep, you keep printing it and then you pay your interest on the debt, on, on the money you've already printed. Uh, uh, with more uh, we'll printing, and you just keep printing faster thing. and faster and faster until eventually uh, you get, you know, your inflation rate is seventeen uh, percent, as it was in the nineteen seventies. And um, and then uh, you know anyone who's owed, owed a million pounds finds that a million pounds won't buy a ham sandwich. So that's you off the hook, you know. Well. That is the way that they're going to get out of out of debt. For this purpose, COVID was an absolute godsend because even before COVID came along, there were um, problems about uh, printing. You know, the repo market had crashed because banks wouldn't lend to each other overnight because they didn't trust each other's assets. And then along comes COVID, and the government said, "Oh, this is great." So. There's a opportunity there to um, use COVID as the excuse to pump a ton of money, trillions, into the economy, and uh, say that uh, it's a, you know, we've got to have a spend now, pay later attitude. And the way that you're going to pay is to grow, outgrow the debt. Now, when that's not going to happen, and so I think there's going to be a flight into hard assets such as. Uh, Gold, silver, um, property, 
you know, land, forestry, Bitcoin, anything, anything that's uh, useful and scarce, uh, which is the two properties by definition that something has to have for it to be valuable. You'll know everything. You know, people will say, "Oh, they'll talk about um, inbuilt inbuilt value, or what's it called?" having some sort of inherent value but then you know you get tangled up into arguments about whether or not you know a starving man would prefer a sausage more than a, a, a man in the desert would prefer a glass of water the point is that for both of those people those two things at that point are both useful and scarce and so they're both valuable in their own respective ways even though the bloke with a uh, who wants a sausage might not want a glass of water and place no value on it and the guy who's uh, in the desert probably wouldn't have much use for a sausage <laughs> don't make your own jokes up so um, yeah so that's how you explain both of them being valuable and not valuable at the same time it's a question of how useful they are at the time and how scarce something that's useful is uh, is useful let's say that you're in a, a garage and um, you want to take a car apart and you need a spanner that spanner is useful to take the car apart uh, it, it, uh, but it's in a garage full of spanners so you know you've got more than one spanner to do the job so that particular spanner is not necessarily very valuable but if you had a particular fixing that where there was only one spanner that undid it and only one spanner you only had one spanner of that time then that spanner would be more valuable than the rest of the spanners because it's not only is it is it you it's got utility but it's also got scarcity and it's uh, you know and it works the other way around something that's scarce you know like a, a plastic bag at the side of this road it might be scarce but what are you going to use it for you know it's not very useful um, and so therefore it's not valuable because although it's scarce it's got no utility um, no, it's not to say that it might not have utility in the future, but at the moment, you know, no one's going to stop to pick up a plastic bag at the side of the road, unless they're the dustman. So, I think uh, the problem is that with interest rates so low, um, the government is very vulnerable to an increase in interest rates, and interest rates are pretty well taken or read off of the what they call the government bond market, which is what the government will pay. Uh, to lend dollars uh, the government writes you an IOU called a bond and it's a promise to pay a certain number of dollars in the future and pay a certain interest rate on the on the on the bond and um, as people lose confidence in the currency they want more and more interest and so the interest that the government has to pay then goes up and a 1% increase in the interest rates on our existing debt which is approaching the whole economy, you know, 97% of the economy uh, is, um, yeah, is worth about 36 billion. So uh, that means that for every 1% interest rates go up, the government has to pay an extra 36 billion. And that's roughly what he's raised in the budget. So his entire budget, the uh, increase in corporation tax and everything, could be completely wiped out by a 1% increase in interest rates. And believe me, that is, that's an easy thing to happen. The only way that uh, they can stop interest rates rising is to, is to buy, the, buy their own bonds, get the uh, central bank, uh, the, the Bank of England, to buy their own bonds, the government bonds, and by buying them, the price of the bond goes up, therefore the, 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 the interest rate relatively is low. Um, it's when nobody will buy bonds that, uh, and they're very, very cheap, that the interest rate rel relatively is high. And that's, uh, so they can't afford to let that happen. Now, the only way they can buy bonds is by printing money. And so you get to a stage where, to insulate yourself from the effects of printing money, you have to print more money. You know, you have to buy, buy your own bonds. Uh, otherwise, you end up paying so much interest. And of course, it's not supportable. You can't, you know, you have to print money faster and faster and faster until the whole thing falls over. But it happens in geological time. So, if you're saying to me, Derek, this sounds somewhat concerning, uh, should I uh, start stacking baked beans? My answer to you will be no, you have got 
the time. However, I would um, advise you to consider moving your assets from anything that's denominated in pounds, like savings, pensions, interest-bearing accounts, anything that where someone is going to have the uh, advantage of paying you back in devalued pounds and uh, move it into something which is more useful and more scarce, you know. And that could be a clock, for all you know. You might like quite like the utility of a clock, uh, an antique clock. You might be able to admire it and your friends will think what a lucky bloke you are to have the clock. And it might be scarce. And the good thing about clocks is that they are not subject to capital gains tax because they wear out. Although if you don't use them, they obviously don't wear out that much. So, you know, so you pay your money and you take your choice. Everybody, uh, everybody has a chance to put their wealth where they think it's going to be stored the best and retain its purchasing power. But um, obviously the most, the biggest investment that a lot of people have got, which is denominated in pounds, is uh, stocks and shares. And because the government's printing so much money and that, that money is going into buying stocks and shares, we've got a situation where we've got the worst recession for 300 years and yet we've got uh, the stock market records being set all around. And you need to um, you need to realise, you need to time it, don't you, correctly. When the clock strikes 12 and the stock market dives 80%, which it has done historically, um, you know, because we're, we're more over leveraged than we were in 1929 in the Great Depression. And then the stock market, I think, dived 80%. But if you leave it a second too late, you won't be able to get out of the exits. Uh, so I would, you know, anyway. So that's my take on the budget. The, the tax is tax is not a way really now of repaying debt, the government debt. Tax is more a way of, um, how can I put it? It's just more a way of redistributing money, you know. You can take money from corporations and, and give it to claimants, or social security claimants. What you're doing is you're redistributing that money. You're not. Uh, you're not in any way. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I know that that money goes into government and out of government again. But by the time the government's uh, spent a load of money on middle management, just redistributing it, then uh, you know the the you, you, the country's worse off. So tax. It used to be. Uh, the government used to do spending and then the government used to raise tax to pay for the spending. But I think that's changed now. I think that the government spends still and uh, but then the government then mucks around with the taxes just to redistribute wealth, usually at the lower levels, you know, the, the, not, not the higher levels, but the lower levels. And then um, the way that uh, the government raises funds to fight wars and things like that is by printing, uh, which basically devalues all the pounds. So... Cash is trash, as they say. All right, well, I was going to talk about non-fungible tokens. Perhaps I'll do that on the way home, you lucky people. I'll uh, see you soon. Bye.